Hello and welcome to this lesson on stave five in the Christmas Carol, the second bit of it today. As ever, we're starting with a retrieval quiz, so follow the link in the middle of the screen if you're on PowerPoint, copy and paste the link if you're on uh, PDF, and if you're on YouTube, just click that link in that description box below this screen. Right, overview of today's session. Now our challenge objective is to extract information, evidence and ideas from stave five. So picking stuff out, lots of that going on today. But hopefully a lot of you will also have been able to push up to that aspire, which is to explore impressions created by Dickens' choices. Um, similar to last time, looking at how he does things, why he chooses to do them that way, and so on and so forth. A bit more evaluative, so a bit of a harder skill there. Now for a starter, we've got a bit of a vocabulary task. So on the screen in the middle, in those um, white and purple boxes, we've got three words, faith, happiness, and generosity, all of which apply to uh, stay five in general and to today's extract in particular. So what we need to try and do is try and think of words that are relevant in terms of those three things, words that are part of the same semantic field. For example, with faith, we could have words such as belief, religion, God, divine, uh, prayer, submission, those kind of ideas, all right? Now, lots of these words would be available, of course, from the recipe book, so you can head to that. Don't forget it is available through uh, the Academy websites. It's always on there. Um, but hopefully this should be fairly straightforward. Now, there is an extension task as well, which is based on your knowledge of the remainder of the narrative. How do you think they might be relevant? So think about how we could apply them to this point in the text. And I would imagine that's probably not a particularly difficult task for you. Uh, the links are pretty obvious. It should take about three, four minutes. Um, I would suggest a little mind map, maybe in your exercise book, or you can simply do it on stage five if you're annotating the actual text in front of you. That's absolutely fine as well. And that brings us to our narrative summary. As always, we have the extract from last time summarised, uh, stage five, part one. And of course, we have a quick summary of stage five, part two, which is today's extract, if that's useful. As ever, if it's useful, read, and if it's not, just move on. That's not a problem at all. Right, and we're on with our extract annotation work. So on the left-hand side, as, as always, we have this brief extract, um, which is the beginning of today's longer extract. And on the right-hand side, we have these four prompts. We have structure, character, language, and another character point as well. As ever, read through the extract uh, and respond to those prompts. If you have the text in front of you, write all over it, please, as ever. If you have a printout in front of you, you can write all over that. And if you're in your exercise book, your notebook, you can write in that instead. But make sure you put a logical title on it always important. Have a read through, annotate, then press play again on this audio, and I will run through some possible ideas and interpretations. Right, the first one. Structure, how is the narrative structure following or linking back to the structure of stave one? Well, in, near the beginning of, st of stave one, Scrooge, of course, saw the, the portly gentleman who came to visit him to collect for charity. And this is the first of a series of encounters which almost um, remodel the structure of stage one. We follow through that series of encounters. And this time, Scrooge has the opportunity to go back and do it right. Um, you know, he's a chance to actually, to donate to charity, to be friendly to people, um, he, to make amends, <laughs> really is the key one. So we are, at this stage, mirroring the structure of stage one and replaying those encounters um, to show the difference. Number two then, character. How is Scrooge behaving here and how does his behavior contrast with stage one? Well, he's being sociable, he's being polite, he's being friendly. This idea of him walking the streets, regarding everyone with a delighted smile, um, talking to people, you know, it's a direct contrast. In Save One, Scrooge rejected everyone who tried to interact with him. Fred, the portly gentleman, the carol singer, you know, even Bob. Um, here, he's open to everybody, and that is really the key difference. He is open to people. Number three, then, language. Which words could be described as part of a semantic field of good humour and pleasantness? Well, for that, we're looking at words such as delighted, smile, pleasant, good-humoured, blithe, blithest. You know, lots of good humour and pleasantness here. But also not just from Scrooge, and that's important. Um, good-humoured refers to those three or four good-humoured fellows who greet him. Um, so it's also interesting that Scrooge's good humour is rubbing off on other people and prompting that behaviour from them as well. Number four, then, why the choice Scrooge makes regarding the portly gentleman a significant one? Well, he could have chosen to ignore him, he could have passed by on the other side, lots of other options. Instead, he confronts it. 
He goes to talk to this man, even though, as, as it says in the text, it sent a pang across his heart to think how this old gentleman would look upon him when they met. He knows that the chap is going to look at him disapprovingly because of how horribly modern stage was. But he also knows it's the right thing to do to talk to him and to make amends for what he did and the way he behaved. So the choice makes it significant because it shows him valuing other people, trying to do the right thing, trying to make up for the wrongs he has done as well. Um, so all those things kind of all in one neat little choice on Scrooge's part. Right, our second part of today's extract. This time on the right-hand side, we have the extract. On the left-hand side, three prompts, this one, so just, just three. Uh, two character, one context, which will hopefully be fairly straightforward. So read through, annotate, press play, and I'll run through some ideas. Right, let's start with the first one, character. How does Scrooge behave to the portly gentleman and what's significant about him specifying his name on this occasion? Well, he's terribly polite right from the start. My dear sir, um, he addresses him in a polite fashion. How do you do? He asks him, um, you know, how he is, in that sense. I mean, how do you do is a greeting, in a sense, but it is also questions. It shows interactivity. I hope you succeeded yesterday. He's remembering him. He's being polite to him. He's very kind of you. He's been um, very uh, generous to him, in that sense, and, and very open to him, very complimentary to him. He wishes him Merry Christmas. He calls him Sir. So every part of what Scrooge is saying here is polite, open, generous, uh, considerate, etc. The name thing is also significant. Now, we talked previously uh, in one of our earlier sessions about the importance of names in terms of a sense of identity. Your name matters because it, it, you know, it's a label for who you are. And names are important in terms of both our sense of who we are and also our openness to other people identifying us and understanding who we are. Now, previously, Scrooge didn't care. Hence the lack of interest in whether people called him Scrooge or Marley. It made no difference to him whatsoever. Here, he's being very clear about exactly who he is. Yes, said Scrooge, that is my name. He's being very, very careful to be very clear that it is him. And that links to the idea of him taking responsibility for his own actions, understanding the importance of his own actions, valuing what other people think of him, and understanding the importance of that social interactivity. Number two, then, character number two. Why is it significant that Scrooge whispers to the gentleman, defers to him, refuses any thanks, and thanks him for taking the money? Well, the whispering thing is important because it's the privacy aspect of it. It's the secrecy of it. Rather than a public display of generosity, Scrooge is simply... Um, trying to pass the money across to him. It's not about Scrooge and recognition for him or public um, you know, appreciation of him. It is simply about doing the right thing, giving the money because he can, hence the whispering aspect. Deferring to him is also important. It's recognising that this man is important. Um, you know, if you please, not a farthing less, will you do me that favour? Scrooge is actually acknowledging that this is the important person, that this the portly gentleman himself is, is, is the powerful person here. And it shows Scrooge actually valuing other people more than he does himself. Um, that's a, you know, that's a very, a very Christian idea in that sense. Um, but it's also about recognising maybe the social value of the gentleman, that what he's doing is a greater good than Scrooge has been achieving. And therefore, he is a better person than Scrooge and therefore being deferred to. The fact he refused any thanks is important as well, because it goes back to the idea of it's not about thanks. Don't say anything, please, the talk of Scrooge, okay? He doesn't want thanks. And in fact, actually, the fact that Scrooge thanks him, because what he is doing is good. And actually, what he's helping Scrooge do is to be a better person. And therefore, Scrooge is benefiting from it. He's benefiting by becoming a better person, because he's being allowed to be charitable. He's being allowed to be generous. And that's why we get the bit at the end there. Um, rather than thanking me, come and see me. Will you come and see me? Thank you, said Scrooge. I am much obliged to you. I thank you 50 times. Bless you. And that wonderful closing at the end there of bless you, that little hint of religion there as well. And then number three, context. How much is linked to both the Malthusian links to Scrooge back in stage one and to the Victorian idea of Christmas charitable giving? Well, this is the anti-Malthus, isn't it? That it's not about um, you know, the poor, being there's too many of them and so on. This is actually about helping your fellow you know, man, to use a Victorian phrase, but helping your fellow person, because it's the right thing to do. This is not Malthusian in the slightest. This is about generosity, public spiritedness, um, you know, caring for those who need it. And then also this idea of the Victorian view of char Christmas charitable giving. There was that trend in the Victorian period of, at Christmas, um, being generous to the poor. Um, but also, partially, it was about Christmas spirit, but also it's about one-off giving, and that was a problem in the Victorian idea about charitable giving. 
that it was only at Christmas rather than all year round. And that was a problem. Um, you know, poor people don't just need help once, they need continuous support until they don't need it anymore. But what Scrooge is also leaving this open to is the idea of a continuous support. You know, he does donate once. If you please the Scrooge, I'll pardon that. A great many back payments are included in it. So he's recognising the importance of a continuous process. This is not a one-off thing. This is a series of payments that I owe, in a sense. But then also this idea of, you know, um, come and see me. Will you come and see me? Scrooge is reaching out in the friendly way um, and making a personal contact, um, you know, with another person. But the implication is also that there is future giving, which he will also do. And therefore it's a continuous process of giving rather than a one-off thing. And that is important at this point in the text. And that brings us to our third part of today's extract. Left-hand side extract, right-hand side, things to find evidence for. Just four today. Uh, have a read. Try to find evidence for those things. Annotate, please, as ever. And then press play on the audio, and I'll run through those ideas for you. Right, first one. Scrooge interacts with people of all kinds, takes delight in doing so. Well, this extract starts with Scrooge going to church, obviously, and walks about the streets. And it says, he patted children on the head, questioned beggars, looked down to the kitchens of houses, up into the windows, found that everything could yield him pleasure. So he's interacting with everybody and looking everywhere he possibly can, and everything is a source of delight for him. And that's very much a key difference for him, isn't it? And people of all kinds, you know, um, children and beggars. And it shows the range of people. And again, you think about the idea of um, that Christian allegory aspect. The idea of children, obviously very, very biblical, the whole um, you know, Christ aspect, which we talked about in previous sessions. And also the beggars as well. But even the lowest of the low in terms of society, in terms of their perception. You know, someone who has you know, no money, no home, etc., a beggar. Even them, Scrooge is, is speaking to um, as if they are equals. Number two, then, Scrooge is open to religious belief and interaction. Well, two different things. One is that he went to church, so instantly. That's the key difference. And then also interaction as well. The fact that he uh, patted children on the head and questioned beggars. He is interacting with people, and that's important as well. Um, and the two very, very different things, which are also part of the same picture. That by interacting with people and being generous to people, he's also shown his Christian spirit, um, you know, and showing the fact that he has been redeemed and retrieved and, and those other things. Number three, then, Scrooge is nervous regarding his reception by Fred. Well, it says, in the afternoon he turned his steps towards his nephew's door. He passed the door a dozen times before he had the courage to go up and knock. He made a dash and did it. And a bit like the portly gentleman, he knows um, his reception may not be positive. He knows he's earned it. He's nervous about it. He's scared of it. And the fact that he's scared of other people and how they will respond to him, react to him, links back to that sense of this isolated child in stave one that we saw. And here it's Fred. Yeah, he is nervous. That's very, very clear. And that's important because it matters to him what other people think of him and how he's treated by other people. He also understands that he has behaved inappropriately previously um, and that there may be a cost attached to that. And yet, he does it anyway. Well done, Scrooge. Number four, then. Scrooge retains his sense of respect and positivity towards people. Well, when the girl, it says, answers the door, he's polite to her. He's a master at home, my dear. My dear is uh, polite, uh, affectionate, friendly, etc. Um, and then we get this little um, addition by, by Dickens in terms of the narration. Nice girl, very. And that's also important because Dickens is almost offering us that statement as if it's from Scrooge's point of view. And it's that blurry thing as there is so often in the text. It isn't fully clear whether this is Dickens the writer, whether it's Dickens as some sort of semi-fictional narrator, or whether it's actually a character link as well. And it should be all those things at once, actually. Um, and of course, he follows it up with uh, my love as well, he calls her. You know, where is he, my love, says Scrooge. Yes, we could view that as a slightly patronising, slightly inappropriate from a modern point of view, but actually in the time the novel is written, that's seen as, as friendly, generous. And don't forget that we have Scrooge, this middle-class, powerful, wealthy man, being polite and friendly and nice to a servant, um, which would be seen as going above and beyond, really, in terms of public spiritedness and friendliness. So that's important as well. And then my dear at the end, he calls her as well. And this brings us on to the last bit of today's extract. As always, extract on the left. On the right-hand side, we've got our bigger question in that yellow box. What is it about this moment that represents a significant shift in the novel personally, narratively, thematically, and linguistically as well? And then that green extension question about the significance of Fred and the link back to stave three. Have a read, annotate, have a think. 
just like what you think about those things, and then press play, and I'll give you a bit of a response from, from my point of view, um, from my interpretation. Right, I will say at this point, you may hear a voice in the background, uh, don't worry about that, it's somebody else in my house as I'm recording this, it's, it, this is crazy, natural light on the side. Right, um, what is it about the moment that represents a significant shift? Well, Perla seems very different. He's gone to somewhere else to speak to somewhere else. Quite often in the novel, what we saw at the start was people coming to him. Fred goes to Scrooge's place of work. Um, the poor gentleman goes to Scrooge's place of work. Even Marley goes to Scrooge's house. They all seek him out to speak to him. Here, Scrooge has gone somewhere else to find another person. And that is a real difference. It's also important because, if you look, he's defining himself in different ways. It's I, your Uncle Scrooge. Scrooge is using his own name. He's defining himself by his relationship to Fred. And that's important. He's reinforcing and acknowledging that familial relationship that he was rejecting in uh, stage one. And that is, again, a really significant thing. Narratively, this is him reconnecting with his family. And that's a really, really lovely moment. It links us back to stage one, of course, when he refused to engage with Fred. But it also links us back to stage two and the character of Fan and that interaction as well. And that's really important as well. Thematically, and again, it, that builds into it, this idea of this openness to other people, the valuing of those social familial links, the acceptance of the role of the past as well, because Fred is Fan's son and recognising that as well. And linguistically as well, because a couple of things. I've come to dinner. He has accepted the invitation, of course, that was um, that was accepted in, in stage one, and you know, and every year it seemed from Fred. That's important. But notice also, will you let me in, Fred? Um, obviously, he wouldn't say it like that. Will you let me in, Fred? Um, but as a question, he's actually acknowledging the power of Fred to say yes or no. He's putting himself in someone else's control, right? And it's a question, and a question as ever is um, an opening move in a dialogue. And what he's seeking here is interaction once again. It's an openness to other people on a number of different levels. It's a lovely, lovely moment. And that links us into our extension question. What is it that is so significant about Fred? And how does it link back to stage three? Well, Fred, remember, he is Scrooge's nephew. But there's more to that. Fred is, of course, Fan's son. Out of all the characters in the novel, there are some people that, that um, Scrooge obviously thinks fondly of, historically, or that valued at the time, and Bella's a key example of that, and Fezziwig is a key example of that. But in the whole novel, there's only one person that Scrooge appears to have adored and, you know, absolutely loved, unreservedly. And that was Fan, Scrooge's little sister, who loved him in return. There's a real bond between the two of them. And Fred represents that last part of Fan, as the uh, spirit of uh, Christmas present in stage three was very, very clear to Scrooge about. Um, Fred is all that Fan has left behind. He's the only part of Fan that is left, that remains. And it may well be, as we said previously, that Scrooge has distanced himself from Fred because of the pain, uh, the loss of Fan. Um, and that's understandable in some ways. But the reconnection with Fred here shows that acceptance of the past, the importance of the past, the importance of family, um, and also part of acknowledging um, the validity of Fred's choices. If you remember back in stage one, the one of the things that Scrooge was very, very critical of with Fred was Fred choosing to marry for love, because of course Scrooge chose not to, um, back in stage two that we saw it. Um, whereas here, it's accepting that, it's accepting all those things. And that's why we get this, um, the party, which was described in stage three. You know, we get uh, Scrooge's niece by marriage, it says. Um, you know, we get this, this wonderful, it's a murky didn't check his arm off. Um, and Fred is delighted to see Scrooge, you know, there is no uh, reason for Scrooge to feel nervous about this. Fred is open to this. He's open to the, you know, the joy of seeing his uncle. His niece looked just the same. So did Topper when he came in, so did the plump sister. So all these things in stage three that he experienced and took pleasure in and took joy in innocently when he was witnessing the party, now he's a part of those things as well. Um, and that's, it's a lovely moment. Wonderful party, wonderful games, wonderful unanimity, wonderful happiness. And everything is wonderful here, a source of wonder. Wonderful, don't forget, in terms of linguistically, just for awareness. Wonderful, it does mean um, full of wonder, as in a, a lovely thing, a good thing. But also it's full of wonder. There's a sense of being surprised and overawed by this. Um, this is a really special thing um, to be, you know, wondered at uh, and to take delight in. Um, and it shows Scrooge actually understanding, in a way that he didn't previously, the importance of these things and the impact of those things, personally, socially, and so on. As you can probably tell, I think it's a lovely little moment, this one. I really, really like it. 
Right, just to draw things together a little bit, um, a bit of an imagery task here. Now, uh, as you can see on this slide, we have got six images from the text. We've got the image of a light and clouds in the sky, an image of money, we've got this image of a child, we have an image of uh, the, the bridge and the river, but the fog is the key part of that one. Um, we've got the image of the turkey, <laughs> yeah. uh, an image of a feather as well. So here's your task. You, you need to identify where do these images occur? Where do we find them? Exact moments if possible, preferably with the, uh, the stage in which they appear and so on. Characters, if there's an association with a particular character, and quotations if you can as well. And even more than that, push it a bit further, what do they represent? What do they symbolise? Now some of these are very obvious. So bottom right with the feather, for example, of course we're thinking of the light as a feather, back at the start of stage five. Scrooge. So you've got a quotation there, you've got a key moment. You've got the idea of him being having been set free, but that link, of course, back to stage one, um, and the heaviness of the chains weighing down Marley, and Scrooge's chain being even longer, and so on. That all fits. Um, some of them are less clear. Um, you know, the image of the child, for example, that could be Scrooge as a child in stage two. Um, it could be Tiny Tim in stage three. It could be Ignorance and Want, in actual fact, in stage three as well. So it's completely up to you which of those you do, uh, but lots of things you could make. Whichever one you do choose, pin down the moment, pin down the stave, or the quotation if you can, and do say what they represent and what they symbolise. Now, there's not necessarily the right answer to this task, so I'm not going to give feedback on this. Have a run through, try and make a few notes as ever. You can make notes in your exercise book if you wish to, a mind map or a list of bullet points, absolutely fine. Go on the script if you'd rather, that's fine too. Even little sketches, if that's a useful way of remembering things. Up to you. It should take about five, ten minutes, not a massive task, but I would hope very much worth while. Which brings us to our plenary. Again, this is a task that will be all too familiar after uh, our previous lessons together. We've got five statements on the screen. Uh, they're called provocations, and there's a reason for that, which is they are interpretations of the text which are valid or partially valid or open to discussion. None of them should be a simple yes, no response. And the idea is that these are all things designed to promote, provoke you into thinking, debating, discussing that kind of idea. So have a read through, decide what you think of each one. You can, of course, write responses, uh, write bullet points if you wish to, write paragraphs if you really wish to, that'd be fabulous if you chose to do that. Um, or simply do it in your head too, absolutely fine. Um, of course, if you have someone to discuss them with, even better, you know, bounce ideas off um, someone you live with, bounce them off a friend, relative, whatever it may be, absolutely fine too. When you've had a chance to consider them, press play, and I will run through some ideas for you. And again, I apologise for the voice in the background. Right, Scrooge is happier being sociable than he was being antisocial. I mean, Scrooge did claim to be happy and content. Um, he talked in stage one about the idea of um, how he kept Christmas and wanting to be allowed to keep Christmas in his own way. At the same time, the fact that we see him chuckling, laughing, being delighted, and so on. Um, you yeah, know, the, 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 um, the, the, the bliss he has in stage five with interacting with people does suggest that he's much happier here than he has been uh, previously. And that does also link back, don't forget, to the idea of stage two, when there is an openness to, stave, uh, to, to Scrooge in stage two, uh, when he's at school, to interaction, to being part of something wider in terms of a social network. And yet, because of his isolation, as a result of his father abandoning him at school, of course, Scrooge became antisocial and rejected that sociability as well and chose to become antisocial. So yes, this is basically a true statement, but there are aspects to it which are worth considering beyond just being right. Second one then, Scrooge is clearly focused not just on being better, but on living and enjoying life. Which is true. If you look at Scrooge in stage five, he does focus on making things better for other people. We have, of course, the turkey being sent to the Cratchit household, but don't forget Scrooge found it very, very funny. So funny, in fact, that he sat in his chair and chuckled till he cried. But that's a prank that you're getting enjoyment from as well. So he is focusing on enjoying things as well as being better. Think about the charitable gentleman, for example. Um, he does, of course, give the man money for the charitable collection to um, provide food and um, you know, essentials for the poor. But he also asks the man to come and see him. And there's enjoyment and pleasure on his part through the act of giving as well. When he goes around and talks to people, he is seeking to engage with people, to be open and friendly to them. But he's also finding, finding delight and pleasure in every single thing, looking through the windows into people's kitchens, you know, seeing the world around him. So it is both about being better, being moral, living a better life, but also living life, interacting with people, taking joy from things, doing things, and enjoying them himself as well. And that's a, an important balance to be striking there. Let's go top right. 
A key part of Scrooge's redemption is making amends with people he has wronged. Yes, that is true on some level, as we see in Stage 5. Um, he gives money to the portly gentleman, he sends food to the Cratchits, he goes to Fred's party, having rejected his invitation consistently previously. But don't forget that redemption is not a one-off thing. It is a process that Scrooge has gone through, right from, um, of course, the first appearance of Marley in the text in Stave 1. Oh, sorry, the only first of Marley, of course, in Stave 1 in the novel. That the redemption is a process he has had to work through, the past, the present and the future, as he says several times in terms of living in the past, present and future. So yes, making amends is a part of it, but is a part of a much, much bigger thing. Scrooge's redemption and ability to be generous are still self-serving and based on his financial advantage in comparison to others. Ooh, this is an interesting one. Are these things self-serving? Well, Scrooge, of course, um, at the end of stage four, he had to confront the idea of his own death and his, you know, being sentenced to be a ghost, potentially like Marley, wandering the earth, unable to escape, tormented forever, and the biggest torment being, of course, being unable to help him, to help people. At the end of stage four, one of the things he was keen on was ensuring that that was a future that he could change, both for himself and for others, don't forget, because, of course, the death of Tiny Tim really, really affected him as well. So you could argue that his ability to be generous is a self-serving thing. He's seeking to avoid that fate. But it is more than that. Um, the joy he takes in the world around him is not just about avoiding that fate. It's about actually enjoying things, taking pleasure in things as well, there's no reason for him to play a prank on the Cratchits, apart from the fact he finds it funny. And that is going beyond just um, generosity and just about redemption in terms of the way he treats other people. It's more than that. It's a change to who he is and how he behaves. Could we argue that his financial advantage um, is important as well? Well, of course it is. But notice he's giving his money away. He gives it to the portly gentleman. He spends money on a turkey for the Cratchits. He gives money to the child as well, all right, who fetches the turkey for him. Um, on every single part of that, he's giving his money away. Um, and yes, he's made money, but he's also doing something with his money. So actually that one, although there's a grain of truth in it, um, it's more wrong than it is right, I would suggest, certainly from, from my point of view. At the bottom then, what makes a good life, Dickens seems, sorry, what makes a good life, Dickens seems to be suggesting, is striking a balance between altruism and indulgence. Altruism, altruism if you don't know, of course, um, is selflessness doing things for other people without a benefit to oneself and indulgence. And Scrooge here, I think, seems to demonstrate exactly that, that there is a balance to the two. In fact, the two can be part of the same thing. Um, is giving a turkey to the Cratchits a selfless act? Well, it's a generous act and one that he takes pleasure in. It does both at the same time, so why not? Um, giving to the gentleman makes him feel better. He's happy to do it um, and it benefits him as well. Why not? Both things make the world a better place. So actually what Dickens seems to be suggesting is, yes, we should be generous. Yes, we should indulge as well. Yes, we, th we should take pleasure. We should take pleasure, pleasure from our generosity as well. Um, and that both things come hand in hand um, in terms of the way we relate to money as a society. So yes, that is largely true. But again, there's a little bit more to it than just a yes or no response. Which brings us back to our overview. Hopefully all of you will feel you've achieved that challenge, which was to extract information, evidence and ideas from Stay 5. And hopefully uh, a lot of you will also feel you've pushed onto that Aspire, which was to explore recent impressions created by Dickens' choices in Stay 5. And those choices, of course, have been linguistic, narrative, thematic, characterisation, all different aspects, really, of it. And if you have thought about those and engaged with them and about the effect of Dickens' choices, then you have definitely achieved that Aspire outcome. Thank you very much for your time today, as ever. It is appreciated. I hope that's been useful for you and not too dramatically you know, dull or difficult. Uh, and I will see you in our next session together. Stay safe, stay well.